Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. This rise kind of really is the the drive to market, uh, as we call it, has occurred, I mean, primarily out of necessity in a lot of countries. I'm based in Canada. Governments have mandated that we stay put, right? And as I'm looking on the horizon in January and winter coming, I'm like, when do I get myself to Florida? (laughs) But it's, it's those restrictions that are kind of difficult to overcome. But there's still that you know, desire for people to get out of their living room or their kitchen, as I said. So it's creating kind of that perfect mix of the need of wanting to kind of move past that this kind of moment in time that we're in while still having to adhere some sort of restrictions. So that has really created the perfect market and opportunity for the drive to travel, which is what our study showed us. Welcome to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast where we discuss all things hospitality, hotels, and business. You can find us online at slicktalkthepodcast.com and on every podcast listening platform. What's up, all my Slick Talkers? Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. This is a really fun one for me because Oracle Hospitality and I are doing a two-part episode series where basically what we're going to do is talk about their data-driven recovery report that they did with partnership uh, with Skift and how this plays into the hotel recovery and hospitality in the U.S. and other markets as well. So this episode, part one, we're going to talk about the data-driven recovery report and the um, data that we saw in regards to drive to destinations. Really fun episode, a big topic in the industry right now, so I hope you guys enjoy this. And then next, uh, on Thursday, the part two is going to be what we see in the lights of recovery long term and how this will play into recovery in 2021, 2022, 23, 24, and etc. Um, moving forward. So I hope you guys enjoy. Don't forget to tune in uh, for obviously every podcast episode, but specifically this amazing two part series with uh, Tanya Pratt from Oracle Hospitality. <laughs> He's kind of like the Joe Rogan of the hospitality industry right now. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. I'm your host, Will Slickers. And today is actually a very special episode because I get to geek out with my good friend, now good friend, Tanya from Oracle Hospitality. I'm excited to dive in this episode with you, Tanya. So let's get right to it. How are you today? I'm amazing. I love being here and thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our talk. Me too. It's going to be some good stuff. Um, I want to kind of just dive in and let's talk about you. Let's get to know who you are. Um, tell us about yourself and your work that you do at Oracle Hospitality and what you really do in the hospitality industry as a whole. I love a good origin story question. Those are the it's best. Always, yes, always good to start out. Yeah. So I have been in hospitality for 25 years now, and I still consider myself to be in hospitality because that is the industry that I serve here at Oracle. And it all really started with what was supposed to be just a summer job. I got a job through a friend uh, working front desk in a 1600 room hotel in downtown Toronto, which is where I live. I was in university at that time studying life sciences, which I know has nothing to do with hospitality. And in my first week in that job, It was like absolute chaos. We had three false fire alarms, as you can imagine, trying to get 25 floors worth of guests out the building is not the easiest thing. We had two sold out nights where guests had to be displaced, which of course is never fun. And I had two double shifts that I had to work because we were short staffed. So the whole week was one solid sleepless nights, uh, adrenaline rush. And you know what? I was hooked. I'm like, this is where I need to be. So the next semester, I switched my major to hospitality and tourism management, and I turned that summer job really into into a a dream career, um, working for three different brands, starting off in hotel operations, then moving into uh, marketing and distribution, and then into IT, where I ended up managing 
all business applications globally. And I always really felt that I kind of had the best job in the company because I got to interact with hotel people who I love on a daily basis. And I also got to kind of geek out, as you said, and draw really cool architectural diagrams on a whiteboard. So it was amazing. And then um, about two years ago, I decided to take all that kind of passion and knowledge that I had in the industry and join Oracle, uh, where my team and I are really focused on driving forward the overall strategy and product de development of Opera Cloud, which is one of our core uh, industry products. So in a way, I kind of feel like I've sort of come a full circle um, and really now get to give back um, and impact the industry that in a way helped raise me. So I'm in a, in a really good spot and thrilled to be doing what I do and thrilled to be talking to you about it. Oh, for sure. And I think it's kind of funny because I think uh, a lot of um, hospitality people have a similar starting. The chaos in the beginning is never like a simple, easy training plan that we all think is going to work out really great. We're going to do all sorts of great implementation of this program with this person. But no, you get really thrown oh, to the yeah. wolves like pretty much right away. And uh, well, like you said, and for sure. And honestly, when I moved from hotel environment into a corporate office environment for the brand, I thought, why are these people going home at five o'clock? Like, <laughs> what is happening? You know what I mean? Because I was just so used to the hustle and the bustle of the 24 seven and the energy. And I know you kind of started off in a, in a large hotel as well. And there's mm -hmm. an energy that can't be replicated. So definitely it was an adjustment moving to kind of a corporate environment in an office world where there was such a thing as a weekend. I'm like, oh, there's people yeah. that don't work on the weekend. My God, what is that like? So it's been amazing. <laughs> No, exactly. I remember walking into work, like just clocking in, pulling out my cash drawer, getting ready to like go out to the guests in the lobby. And it's like, it's kind of like going on stage. You have to really turn on a, a big like light switch in your head. But the adrenaline rush, like you said, is like you have a line of 300, 600 people out the door and you're like, all right, let's do let's this. Let's do it. So, let's bring yeah. it. And, you know, preparing yourself for the, yes, sir. I'm really sorry it rained yesterday. It was my fault. You couldn't take your kids to the zoo let me see how I can make it up to you. You're right. You are, yeah. you do in a way kind of assume a role. You can't take it personally. Otherwise you'd go home and like be depressed all day long, but you also get a change to get a chance to impact the, the guests and the experience that they have for a lot of them. It's like they're one time out of their house in a year. So it's, uh, it's amazing. We can talk yeah. about this forever. Just little, everybody has a hotel story, whether they worked in a hotel or with just a guest, everybody has some sort of a, you know, pivotal point in their life that was spent in a hotel and they always remember it. Exactly. I think it's, and we talk about this on the show all the time is about little moments and acting on those moments. We have them all the time, every day, but making like the conscious decision to act on, like, yes, like you said, I know it rained yesterday and you didn't get to go to the zoo. And to us, that's like at way out of our control, way above like a normal problem, but taking that moment, realizing the guest is frustrated and say, okay, like they're obviously frustrated for a different reason. And I'm here to actually re like recognize this in a certain light that most people wouldn't and make this moment a little bit better, which is super sure. cool. Um, you become like everyone's like little therapist in a way. It's, it's just, well, and yeah. it's those things that people remember. It's like after a while, every hotel sort of becomes the same. Can you really remember what the room looked like? Can you really remember what was on the menu in the restaurant? But the person that you know created that moment that matters for you and you form that emotional connection with is what you take away. And that is why people keep coming back. And that is why 100%. our industry is going to push through all of this mm -hmm. and end up on the other side because people will remember what it felt like before March of this year. I couldn't agree more. I said it better myself. And I, I really like this episode. I've been looking forward to this. We've been planning it for a while. Um, and I just... The reason why this is really exciting for me, because like you said, the geek out, the the nerd in me, uh, I worked with uh, Opera when I was brand new front desk agent. It wasn't the cloud-based solution, but I loved Opera and I was a total geek. Like when I went to another hotel, I was independent boutique and we had MSI and other programs. It was, it just wasn't the same. So it's cool to have somebody where I started my roots with uh, that understands like, okay, this was like the program that like really got me going and excited. So I'm excited to really just showcase that side of the, like the geek hospitality 
coolness that most people don't think is exciting, but really it's is. It's awesome. And let me ask you this. So here's yeah. what I do whenever I go to a hotel. I always peek beh behind the front desk to see what they use. Do you do that too? I think it's just an industry thing. Yeah, no, I, I don't peak in the sense like I kind of will try to like look over depending on the desk level but um I'll be checking in totally normal like oh Mr. Slickers blah 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 blah. your room is this this and that and then, like the last question I'll ask after like asking about the restaurant or bar is what uh what what system do you guys use back there are you using uh MSI or are you using opera or whatever like yeah. what are you using and then they'll usually tell me and then they're like oh do you work in hotels I'm like no I don't anymore awesome. but I used to awesome. Yeah, it's it's a it's a fun little, and then they usually, like you said, it's those little moments that leads into more conversation, and yeah, really cool stuff. Um, but I want to actually elaborate on the Oracle hospitality for um, obviously, like you just kind of explained, and we talked about opera. What is like the, the main purpose and drive for for what you guys are doing uh, with the segment of Oracle? No, great question, and I I'm glad we got to it because we could have spent an hour just talking about other things. So. Oracle Hospitality really dominates the hospitality technology vendor uh, landscape. Um, we provide mission critical technology solutions to independent hotels, global and regional chains, um, casinos, cruise lines. Um, it's cloud-based mobile enabled solutions that help the, with the property management, point of sale, distribution, sales and event management, reporting and analytics, and many, many more. So really our drive and purpose is to give hoteliers the tools that they need in order to deliver those exceptional guest experiences, because in the end, that's sort of, that's what matters. Um, our flagship product includes our property management system, Opera, uh, as you mentioned, and Opera Cloud, which is our next gen product, as well as Symphony Cloud, which is our, our point of sale solution. And Opera Cloud, which is sort of what I am uh, responsible for and focused on right now, and an entire team uh, behind me. I mean, I'm just fortunate enough that I get an opportunity to sort of talk about it, but it, it's literally an army of people that makes this happen every single day. It's um, cloud-based, mobile-enabled, as I said, and really next-generation hotel property management solution. It is based on the opera that we all, all know and love. I was also a user and for 15 years was responsible of implementing it in our in our the brands that I worked for and kind of teaching them how they can use it to improve their operational efficiency. So we've retained those core kind of things part of opera. It's DNA, which is all about the customer profile and really kind of taking it to the next le level by making it uh, mobile enabled and device agnostic. Um, so it's really, it is that sort of leading enterprise solution suite for the hospitality uh, industry. It offers an intuitive user in interface, meaning that those people that are, you know, it's my first job, kind of like I had and you had, it shouldn't take a lot of time to learn, right? When we download an app from an app store, nobody's given us a manual. Uh, if I was to ask my teen ask teenage kids to read a manual, they'd be like, yeah, that's not happening. It needs to be something that I can click on and very, very easy to learn. So that's really kind of been our focus from a design perspective. And I always, you know, I think back to who I was as a user 25 years ago, and I'm like, how would I feel? How would I feel if management came to me and said, we have a new application for you, and this is what you need to use eight or 10 or 12 hours a day, you know what I mean, for your day job. And you need to, you know, press keys on the keyboard and look at the screen while you're also talking to the guests and smiling with your eyes. There's a lot going on. So we want to make sure that that person that's standing there at the front desk or frankly anybody in the hotel can spend 90% of their time just interacting with the guests and not having to worry about the technology. So again, very intuitive. Uh, comprehensive functionality for all areas of the hotel, not just front of the house, but back of the house as well. Secure data storage. Of course, that sounds like a given that the technologies are going to be secure, but we've seen a lot of incidents where th they are not. And that's what kind of grabs the headlines out there in the press. So we, we have kind of the entire Oracle uh, infrastructure and security behind us, helping make sure that the data that we have on behalf of our customers is always uh, secure. We have uh, hundreds of key partners and interfaces and um, that really help our customers accelerate innovation, not just through the things that we do ourselves within Opera, but really how the customers are able to leverage the partner network 
and extend those services beyond just the property management system. Because no hotel can operate on their own. It's like, I'm going to shut off from, from the world, no distribution channels, no um, you know, partners or vendors that provide service apps. So uh, we recognize and acknowledge that and therefore have built Opera Cloud in such a way that allows for those uh, extensions as well. Um, I mentioned Symphony, so obviously point of sale, key for a lot of our customers that have very, very robust food and beverage offerings, and even those that may not, they may have just a kiosk where somebody can buy a sandwich or um, some sort of a little pantry, pantry off the side of the front desk, so if you need a Snickers bar in the middle of the night that you can actually get that, but through Symphony Cloud and uh, Opera together, there's that seamless integration. So. It, it's really about, like I said, having that comprehensive suite of solutions that help our customers manage uh, every different aspect of, our, of their business. And I love that you said that out the gate, like what would I want from when I was a front desk agent or like how, because that is like the biggest indicator and different, like that's the way you set yourself apart is because I think there's a lot of great tech companies out there um, in other industries as well, you know, all over the world that do good things, but they don't implement it from like the user standpoint. And that is what I love about the whole opera feature is it's like going at it from a front desk agent or from, you know, a concierge perspective. This is really important because the being able to use it and not have to like study, you know, 20 pages or PowerPoints of how to check in a guest or even split a folio or just simply process a refund on a credit card or do something like that. Um, it's really important to like understand that like the user perspective. And then of course, not having to um, have it just be customized for your way of doing business, but for the way of the hotel, like connecting with other key partners and customizing how you create that experience for your guests. Super key, super like, I think that's, again, like I said in the beginning, just the number one way to indicate yourself as a differentiator and a, and a change maker in the industry by really going from the perspective of the operator and then how to make that operation customizable for the business in order to offer the best um, experience. It's really great. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right, Will. And, you know, I've always believed and I don't know whether it's because kind of where I came from and sort of what my origin story is, uh, as I say, but I fundamentally believe that we live and die by operations. If operations can't successfully execute a strategy, it doesn't matter how brilliant it was in, in a boardroom, right? And how good that marketing campaign may be or whatnot. If ultimately the person that has, has to deliver the experience to the guests or that has to execute on that strategy is not able to do it effectively and is not able to do it consistently in a repeatable way because it's so cumbersome to do, they're not going to do it. It's not because necessarily, it's not because they don't want to, it's not because they don't feel like they need to, but it's simply difficult to do. And things get busy. We have, you know, we talked about kind of the stories at the front desk. If you have a lineup of a hundred people in front of you and your check-in takes five minutes, you're not going to like it. Cause by the time you get to person number 10, they're going to be like, uh, I hate you and I hate your hotel and I'm going yeah. somewhere else. So yeah. again, having those technologies that are intuitive, customizable workflows that can be, you know, customized down to the user or for, for the hotel or for the brand is, is key because again, it has to be simple. It has to be intuitive. And that is the only way that people will use it consistently. Exactly. And that's what can kill a lot of drive. Like if poor operations is happening in a hotel, that's what can kill a lot of drive for the younger generations of like hoteliers because they have all these ideas and they love what they're doing. Kind of like how you and I started and then, but not being able to execute it because the operation structure doesn't allow it to. That's like, that's a, the biggest buzz kill you can think of. I think as like a- Nobody as, wants to stand there and be yelled at yeah. all day long, right? Exactly. Or, or not see their ideas come to life. So it's, uh, it's definitely key that we create an environment and uh, provide technologies that have, can help people successfully execute. Yeah, I love that. See, I'm a big fan. I knew, I knew this was going to be a great episode right out of the gate. Um, we need to have a part two. Yes, I'm down for a part two. Always, 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 always. Um, well, I understand. So like we're in an interesting time in the world, obviously, in April and March and well, yeah, March and April and just with the whole COVID-19 pandemic at hand, um, you know, 
we have had quite a hit, but we've also had quite an influx in shifting in the industry. Um, I would, and I understand from this is kind of like where this all began is that you and um, you know, a partnership with Skift recently released some compelling research around the globe in hospitality recovery. And I want to talk about that. And so I really think it's key to understand uh, if you could tell us about the development of the hospitality recovery study, and then of course the partnership and collab with Skift. Course. So first of all, there's nothing that I love more than a good research study, because for as much as I trust my gut on some things, I love to have facts to back them up. So this was a tremendous and we were really, really happy to see this come to life. So um, as you said, the study was called a data driven look at hospitality's recovery. It was a global study and um, researched or reached out to 4600 consumers and 1800 hotel executives and to really get a feel for their attitudes and outlook on travel, including changes to the guests and employee experience, um, changes to booking policies and distribution, and really the overall industry recovery outlook. So it was quite, quite comprehensive. Yeah, then for the listeners that are listening, um, obviously it's gonna be tagged in the show notes. So I highly recommend you read this and go over it, but there's a lot to cover and there's a lot covered in this data study. And like you said, I'm a big fan of good studies that provide a lot of key indicators and data. But um, so I really wanna see you, 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 you got this data from a lot of a lot of hotels. Like let's just, mm-hmm. I'll say a lot <laughs> instead of putting a number to it. Um, what were some of the key findings? And I think, you and I, like you said, we trust our guts because we're probably thinking, you know, drive destinations and all sorts of other things, but there's now data to back this up. So I want to know what these key findings were that really did come from this whole research. Yeah. So overall, the, the findings really showed us that the hospitality industry continues on its road to recovery. Um, that technology will be critical to protecting travelers and uh, workers. Um, Safety absolutely remains consumers' top priority when they consider traveling, and the hospitality industry is really kind of doubling down on their efforts in investing in technologies to facilitate social distancing, um, to reduce face-to-face interactions for guest protection, and it's really kind of to make them feel comfortable again about, like, deciding to leave their living room. I mean, for a lot of us, our habits have changed. And they were, they were going to have to change them again. I spent 20 years on the road. January, uh, March came and I'm like, oh, here is my family. And I see them every day. That's unusual. And that was the reality for a lot of people, right? So now the time comes where we're starting to see some glimmers of hope. We now need to dislodge ourselves from those old habits and get back into kind of uh, resuming the life as we know it before March. So again, overwhelmingly, Uh, consumers share that they're able to travel, uh, but with certain conditions, of course. Health, safety, it's a primal need, right? Before we we think about anything else, those obstacles really need to be uh, overcome first before the travelers consider doing anything else. So that's really the key for them. Um, One of the other findings is that just over, I think it was about 50% of the people surveyed said that they plan to book the trips in the next six months. And they're all saying that they're opting uh, to stay closer to home with uh, driving distance or domestic trips being favored. So this rise kind of really is the the drive to market, uh, as we call it, has occurred, I mean, primarily out of necessity in a lot of countries. I'm based in Canada. Governments have mandated that we stay put, right? And as I'm looking on the horizon in January and winter coming, I'm like, when do I get myself to Florida? <laughs> but it's, it's those restrictions that are kind of difficult to overcome. But there's still that you know, desire for people to get out of their living room or their kitchen, as I said. So it's creating kind of that perfect mix of the need of wanting to kind of move past the, this kind of moment in time that we're in while still having to adhere some sort of restrictions. So that has really created the perfect market and opportunity for the drive to travel, which is what our study showed us. Um, the other thing is that with kind of all this, in, in some areas, still a lot of uncertainty ahead, it's also no surprise that consumers are demanding flexible cancellations and refund policies, about 76% of them responded favorably to that. 
and uh, more and more are open to considering hotels offering discounted rate about 65%, of course, that makes sense. So it's really good to see that the industry as a whole, including the airline industry, has responded favorably to those demands. I think, again, it's, it's about trying to make people feel more comfortable about resuming their life in that sort of a way and making them um, feel like they can, both from a safety and security perspective, as well as having some flexibility on the booking and cancellation perspective. Um, and then kind of finally, really this consumer, overall consumer willingness uh, to travel again does come with some heavy caveats for the hotels in terms of the advancements that they have to make in cleaning and technology. I mean, hotel rooms have always been cleaned. I've worked in a hotel, you worked in a hotel. You know what I mean? I, I see and I remember what kind of the housekeeping teams would need to go through and the different cleaning supplies that they had. Now it really becomes about, you know, taking it up to the next level, but also communicating it effectively. Like no hotel would ever put on their website, we clean our rooms. Like that's like saying, you know, we have, um, I don't know, pillows in the room. <laughs> it's just one of those things like that, that's not a point of differentiation. But now that almost needs to be one of those lead off things to say what your cleanliness standards are, you know, how is the tra staff trained in order to adhere those standards like that has become the norm. It's like your lead off statement before you say how many restaurants and pools you have, you're like, we clean our room three times per day or something like that. So that that's really, I think, again, shows how much things have had to change in a very short period of time. And the good news is that Six, 70% of the hotels were already planning on, on doing that anyway. And they were already planning on adopting the contactless technologies. I mean, mm -hmm. contactless and touchless technologies or having direct to room or you know, somebody not having to step, to, uh, step in front of a front desk is something that the industry has been talking about for a long time, right? But they've also been like, hmm, do I spend X amount of dollars on a new system or do I buy new sheets? right for my room like it's always been yeah. that sort of a conversation this has definitely pushed that priority to to the forefront but i think in in reality also or the other the kind of other side of that coin is that for a lot of people and i'll use my mother as an example standing in front of a front desk talking to somebody for 15 minutes about you know the paintings in the lobby is part of her travel experience Mm -hmm. For me to tell her, you're going to get a digital key on your phone, go directly to your room. They're like, well, no, she feels like she's missing out on something. She's not getting her money's worth. Mm -hmm. And there will continue to be those sort of travelers. So for the industry as a whole, it really comes to offering options because yeah. different things will be meaningful to different people. Some will be like, I never want to see front desk. I know where the elevators are. You don't have to tell me I've been in this hotel 20 times. And for them, we have to make sure that those experiences can be facilitated in that way. And then for others, it's again, offering them the experience that they want, but in perhaps a, a safer way than we've had to do in the past, more distance or, or whatever that looks like. But it really is, um, as I see it, about offering uh, choices. And touchless doesn't need to mean that it's sort of low service or, or low touch doesn't mean it's low service. I think those experience could still be had is just in a bit of a different way. Agreed. And to touch on a couple of things, I think the drive to distance destination model is a really kind of a lifesaver for the industry as a whole, because, you know, there is a lot of foreign travel that happened prior to COVID, which is great. Like we, I love that like that adventure, right? But now it's giving us an intentional time to really focus on our local destinations, our local neighborhoods that maybe weren't, you know, they were suffering prior to COVID. And now they're actually thriving because people are getting out, but they're not getting too far and they're still staying close to home, but they're learning what's right around the corner, which is really cool. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And I, you know, I always tell people this story, which is like every single relative I ever had that lived outside of Canada, when they would come to Toronto, they're like, let's go to Niagara Falls. Have you ever been? I'm like, no, why would I go to Niagara Falls? Like it's in my backyard, but like, why would I go? Now I'm yeah. like, let's go to Niagara Falls because it's only two hours away. So you're exactly. absolutely right. I think people are starting to discover almost sometimes for the first time, something that's been in their backyard all along. And to me, that's really, really powerful. Yeah. And hoteliers are now like seeing the cool local partnerships that they can form in order to enhance that experience. So like the, the whole stay local movement prior to COVID 
was really great movement, but it wasn't the right time because I, a lot of people, you know, like you said, we're like, why well, go there when I have it right in my backyard? Now it's right there. And now it's able to be more intentional, create that better experience. Um, the, the state local movement, I'm pretty sure is like thriving more than ever, uh, which is really cool to see as well. And then I liked what you said about um, the operational point again, it's just kind of, it's like dating, right? I think it's, you, you have like these little things you have to kind of figure out with the, the guest and kind of communicate and communication is really key in relationship. So when you have like my girlfriend and I actually experience this like all the time. And so it's like, I under communicate sometimes and she over communicates and, but there's a still a point that we need to communicate. So when it comes to like cleaning standards or, you know, showing that your, your housekeeping staff is like showing your credentials for how you're handling the COVID. Um, it's different. Like you said, I remember helping my housekeeping team all the time with rooms and flipping and inspections. Um, and the guests never gets to see that they get to see a perfectly clean room that is met to standard across the board. But now we actually have to be intentional again with communication. It's a relationship between us and the guest, which is really, really important. And us with our staff, like our staff, um, you know, I always say there's a lot of people that maybe disagree sometimes, but the, the, the guest is first and staff are second. But honestly, I go the other way around a lot of times. Staff is first and guests are second because when my staff is happy, they're safe, they're protected, they're taken care of, they're educated. That's when they're going to do the best for the, the guest. And that guest is going to be able to learn more and have a better interaction. And like you again said, the guy that wants to check in and just go to his room and not see the front desk. He knows that he has that option is customized. It's a relationship. They, they don't have to do it the way we do um, because we have limited options. We have so many options that we can customize the experience for everybody, which is super important and drive to destinations and COVID really just captured everything. So I love how you said that great, great information. And I think a great perspective. Um, so obviously key findings, we're talking about rise of uh drive destinations do you think gives this gives hoteliers a chance to work on their local markets a little bit more obviously we talked about um the the uh you know stay local drive local be local movement but is this really being acted on from the data that you're seeing from this uh this research yeah no absolutely i think we're getting there more and more and truthfully in more, most markets um hotels have always done that Right, they've always formed very strong relationships with their local suppliers and their network. It's just that we've now kind of increased the awareness of it again and given it a label. <laughs> but these relationships has, have always really been there. So there's definitely an awareness in the industry that when you are loyal to locals, the locals will be loyal to you. And so the hotels have always, I think, leveraged those relationships. Um, and it's really those relationships that, as we're seeing right now, are helping sustain them. Right. And, and, you know, they're reaching a, a wider audience in a way or, or they're sustaining them because they're not able to reach a wider audience in a way like those international markets are, are just not there. So um, the relationships that they formed in the past are helping them now and will carry them through into the future. What I, what I think will happen with a lot of hotels that maybe have not focused on the local market as much, they will see how powerful they can actually be and will carry that themselves or will carry that into the future. I really believe that. Yeah. I think it carries some weight with the brand as well. Like when you're just a hotel that's branded a certain way, but then you get to carry on these other well-trusted established brands that have been in the neighborhood for 20 plus years or 10 years or whatever, and have done amazing things. It just adds more, not just value, but just the overall credibility, I think really with, with what the hotel is trying to do and communicate with the guests, which is absolutely. Yeah. It's great. Well, okay. So now here comes a big question because yeah. hotels, you know, boutique, large corporate, there's a pretty big difference, but how can hoteliers now with every level, like we just talked about corporate or boutique, apply this to the recovery market? So, you know, it's really not that magical or that revolutionary. It's really about going back to the basics. So understand yourself, understand your customer very well basics right don't try to be all things to all people it's not going to work stay focused um second as i mentioned earlier leverage your no local network are there suppliers partners that currently you know, you, wor you work with that have employees that could really use a night off from cooking right invite them over host them in your hotel third 
and they should probably come in as number one because like you said to me it's like employees take care of your employees and take care they will take care of your guests but to me it's really also like leverage your employees they're your biggest fans and the best ambassadors the word of mouth that a loyal satisfied employee has and the power of that word of mouth is huge no piece yeah. of marketing collateral can ever outweigh that so again think about what can you do for them to help them feel valued and less unsettled during this time because as an industry and as a as an entire you know kind of global not just workforce but humanity people are unsettled so mm -hmm. focus on the employees and what can make make them kind of feel better about that and fourth um, again, be uh, loyal to the locals and the loyals will be uh, local to you. No one knows that destination better than the people live, that live in it, except maybe mm -hmm. me and Niagara Falls, but I know yeah. a lot about it now. So let them tell you what they love about it. Let them tell you what they love about your hotel. Give them an opportunity to, you know, share some of the experience that they have had and use that to communicate further. Those experiences where we will bring people back. Um, bring them in for a chat. Like I said, let them help you create a feeling of community and a sense of belonging within your own property. The customers will love it. They will come back and they will remember it long after all of this is behind us. Agreed. And to touch another like really just key part about that we talked about in the show a lot about like marketing and operations, but there's a way to bridge the gap between marketing and operations. I'm pretty sure you've seen this with your career as well, is that, you know, sometimes the marketing team has one agenda and goal to do this and drive revenue or do, you know, a certain marketing campaign, then operations is still handling the day to day and they're getting with the hustle and bustle and putting out all the fires. Um, bridging the gap between marketing and operations is by getting your team, the super fans that are your ambassadors. I still have guests that I talk to from my first hotel on a regular basis. I can tell you Mr. Yeah. Chardin and Mr. Rhodes and Mrs. Uh, what's her, oh, uh, no, how am I forgetting her name? Anyways, um, the, they're all still local ambassadors for that hotel because even though we, you know, they were just doing their business or, you know, seeing family, whatever, um, creating those experiences, having your team bridge that, you know, the gap of marketing and, and operations, um, being able to be the marketer for you instead of just I'm here to check you in. That's all I really know. I don't know about all these other initiatives or whatever else is going on. Um, that's where you'll really stand out and really make a big, big impact, especially with recovery, like you just said. Definitely. It's like, well, we all, we all have those experiences and not just with hotels, but how many movies have you seen or how many books have you read because a friend recommended it? Not because you saw it on a shelf or, you know, you saw an ad for it somewhere. It's because somebody that you trust said you should do this. And exactly. it's absolutely the same in travel, like the, the destinations that I've gone to that I never would have dreamed of, because it's like I could probably couldn't even find a country on a map. And then somebody I knew just came back from and said, you need to go there. And I did. So yeah. that sort of word of mouth is very, very powerful. So understanding it, knowing it, leveraging it um, is really, really one of the best things that the hotels can do now. 100%. And I remember the name, Miss Malone. If you're listening, I'm sorry I butchered and totally forgot. Um, thank you for understanding. Wouldn't it you be know. funny if she called in? <gasps> oh, gosh. That's my biggest fear is like, I'll get a text for one day just from somebody that listens and they're like, hey, I heard you'd mention me. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. But uh, it's good stuff. It's all good. Um, so now we're going to, you know, we've covered a lot. And I think there's so much that still goes into this whole data driven recovery report. Um, but is there anything that listeners should know about the rise to drive in markets other than, uh, and you know, how it's affecting the industry, obviously um, for me, what I'm always curious about, is this going to be a short-term trend or a long-term trend? Are we going to see this after COVID or do you think maybe, you know, once international travels open up again, we might, obviously we'll see a dip, but will it be gone the way it was before? Definitely here to stay. Because what one thing that consumers would have discovered out of all of this, those that have never done it, is that they can do it and it can still be enjoyable. The other thing about drive to travel market is that you can do it more frequently. Yes, getting on a plane and flying across the ocean is amazing and you have all these different experiences, but it's also expensive. It takes more time, more planning, and you can't do it every weekend. 
Whereas to get into your, your car, drive for an hour and a half somewhere, it's like, yeah, okay, you can wake up on a Saturday morning and decide that that's what you want to do. So although we will see international travel return, I don't think that it will displace the local travel that we're seeing right now. I think the two will uh, blend into one another and um, people will remember that, it, that it's something that it's still enjoyable and doesn't require a lot of effort. So that is for sure. So it, it, it's here to say, um, the other thing that I would sort of recommend, um, and I remember this even from the past, it's really being smart, <clears throat> sorry, with, uh, with what the hoteliers already have um, and really put to use the investments that they've already made. So a lot of hotels have already made some excellent investment in technologies, right? The reality is they're probably using only 50% of the functionality that, actually, that exists. You may have learned about it, you may have read it somewhere, then you got out of the habit of using it and then you forgot. So take this opportunity to really educate yourself, look for seminars or webinars or ask the vendor for opportunities uh, to do some of these new learning. So, and, and most often than not, it's not necessarily about buying something new, some shiny new toy. It's really about using what you already have to its potential. So. This is a good time to really, like I said, take a look at what you already have and, and see how you can use it to its potential. I think that would definitely be key because nobody's in a position right now to spend a lot of money on something new. So yeah. uh, exploit what you already have. Um, the other thing is that the travelers have really kind of traditionally welcomed vacations or looked at vacation as something that needs to be very elaborate. And I sort of said that a little bit earlier, which is, I think they're now discovering that it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to take six months of planning. It doesn't need to take planes and trains and bicycles and shuttles and all of that. Um, they're seeing the travel can look different and it can still be enjoyable. So to, to not have to spend a lot of time and effort and money on planning some things and still have that enjoyable experience is a new discovery for some. It was a new discovery for me but I'm now going to do it more often because I see the difference that it makes in being able to get out of the house, see something a little bit different, eat food that we didn't cook, which is awesome, <laughs> and uh, have that sort of experience and then remember it and say, you know, and have selfies to show for it. Because yeah. if it's not on Instagram, it didn't happen. Exactly. That's, that's you took the... <laughs> You took the words right out of my mouth and say, there's no, it's no hashtag moment. It didn't happen. Okay. So no, I love that. Absolutely. Love so, that. you know, the hotel, you should really kind of focus on that. Re remember that, um, think about how they can better serve their local traffic. How can they continue to innovate with what they already have? Um, yeah. How can they adapt and, and change, you know, a little bit of themselves to create those fresh experiences so that even for somebody that comes back once a month, that it still feels a little bit different and fresh from a, from an experience perspective. Are there promotions? Are there you know local foods that they can now put on the menu so that it can be kind of a farm to table experience or something like that? All of those things are sound really simple and can be overlooked, but that is what the travelers are seeking right now, and that is what they will remember in the future as well. Exactly. It's like we're looking far ahead, but now we're now we're able to look at closer radius and see what's already in front of us. It's like um, in the military, you know, when we were going through training, we have we're always told look five, 10, 20 and 30, because if you're always looking at 30, you're going to miss something right in front of you and it could you know cause a big accident. But in this sense, it's more look at the toolbox that you already have. Look at the tools that you're already using that are just kind of sitting there and like you said, not being implemented to the full capacity. You know, I may have a, you know, a electric drill, but am I using it and all the features and all the bits that are coming with it? It's really, really important. So, yeah. and you know, there's a saying, and I, I don't know whether it was a company that I worked for, or whether I read it like on a bumper sticker or something like that, but there's a saying of like, you know, think globally, act locally, but it's like, yeah. why not think locally? Yeah. Think locally, act locally. And there's a lot of experiences that hotels can provide to their guests that are, you know, not more than 100 kilometers. I'm saying kilometers, not miles uh, away from their property. Um, and they will still remember it and they'll be seeking it out in the future as well. 
hundred percent. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think you hit all the nails on the head speaking of toolboxes. So I just want to say, thank you. Honestly, it's been a great to chat and learn more about obviously who you are, but then of course, all this data that you guys put together, is super incredible, super needed and useful for the industry right now um, more than ever. So I'm just honored to have you on the show and get to geek out a little bit. Thanks for joining me. And would you like to leave the listeners with any last thoughts or, you know, maybe a shameless shout out or plug? Well, I, I'm going to put it on you and say that getting a chance to talk to you and feeling your love and passion for the industry uh, makes me love even more what I do every day. So thank you for this opportunity in this time of uncertainty for all of us. Sometimes we forget why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is really kind of um, put back in my mind the all the good that our industry delivers to humanity, as I mm-hmm. said. I hate to make it that grand, but it is. And every single one of us that are fortunate enough to be in this industry, and I guess maybe that's my kind of takeaway for uh, the listeners, is remember the difference that you are making to somebody's experience and dare I say life every day. It may seem really, really small, but we never know, you know who that person is standing across the front desk from us or in a restaurant, why they're there, what their lives are about. So even being able to make an impact on their experience in a very small way is likely something they will remember forever and tell the story over and over and over again. So I think we're very, very fortunate and lucky and should never take for granted the fact that we get an opportunity to do that every day. I'm not going to cry. 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 That was great. So no, thank you again for just being on the show. Um, Slick Talkers, listen to obviously the whole episode. And if you have gotten this far already, uh, look in the show notes. I'm linking everything, everything, every, everything. Uh, Tanya's LinkedIn. We're going to put the recovery report in here. We're going to do Oracle's website, everything. So you name it. Uh, Again, thank you so much for being on the show. And Slick Talkers, make sure you tune in again next week. And of course, Stay tuned because there may be a part two. Thank you so much for listening. We love your support and want to provide the best we can to all our listeners. So please find us online, social media, and on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast. What's up, everybody? If you've gotten this far into the episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast, then you are amazing, and thank you so much for tuning in. We want to send you two places really quickly. If you can, check out the show notes and click the hospitality.fm link. Check out all of our other shows on the podcast network. And don't forget, if you have someone that you want to hear on the podcast, then fill out the guest fill-out form so that way we can get them on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy another episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast. Podcast.